Back in the 1800s, the great gastronomic writer Briat Savaran wrote, tell me what you eat and I'll tell you what you are. Today I'm gonna to take you on a tour of the Oaxaca market to uncover some of the uniqueness of this incredibly rich culture. But let's face it, most visitors to the Oaxaca market take away one vivid memory. Chapulines, the little toasted grasshoppers that are made into soft tacos with a little dab of guacamole and some salsa. That's a unique experience, but I want to take you beyond it. Even if you just have the simplest hotel room, you can come into the market and buy beautiful bananas. And they have such an incredible variety of them here. Of course, they've got the red bananas, the plantains, which require some cooking. But my favorite of all bananas are the manzano bananas. Their flavor is sort of tangy and rich and complex. It'll remind you a little bit of an apple flavor in a banana. That's where it gets its name, manzano. If you're a little more intrepid, you might want to buy one of these beautiful papayas, ask the vendor to help you choose one that's perfectly ripe, but you're gonna really need something more like a kitchenette if you want to take advantage of some of the more tropical fruits that you'll find in this market. Here we have Granada Chino, which is a version of passion fruit, but not quite so aromatic. This is the guanabana, which is very tropical in its flavor and kind of tangy. And then of course, the beautiful Mexican guavas. Now, if you wanna make those into a smoothie, you're gonna need a, a blender, which is what I love to do with all three of these things. But the guavas are so beautiful if you just make a little simple sugar syrup and poach them there. Most people would walk up to a stall like this and see a Oaxacan version of a farmer's market stall. Me, I see salsa, because these beautiful purple blush tomatillos make one of the most delicious salsa verde, green salsas that I can imagine. Of course, I would need a little chili to give it some spice, so we've got the serranos here, or jalapenos, but I would choose the local chile de agua. I'd roast it and peel it, and then I would season that salsa with a little bit of this unique red garlic that you find here in Oaxaca. Then I would chop up some of these fresh dug knob onions, maybe chop up some avocado to add in there as well. But of course, most of us think of salsa verde, even if it's got chopped avocado in it, as really delicious with cilantro. Let's talk about cilantro because I get more questions about growing cilantro than I do about growing anything else for the Mexican kitchen. And the question that I get the most is, why does my cilantro go to seed so quickly? So I have a couple of things to say. And the first one has to do with just planting it more frequently or what we would call succession planting. Every three or four weeks, you plant a new little round of cilantro, or better yet, you plant it in pots. Now, I would recommend that you get a high quality potting soil for that. Sow the cilantro seeds about a quarter of an inch below the level of the, the top. Keep it uniformly moist and put it in a really sunny spot. Then every three or four weeks, plant a new one but say you don't have much room or you forgot to plant and you've got your plant in beautiful flower like this, do you just cut it down? No, my suggestion is try the blossoms. They are really, really delicious. And then after the blooms have actually formed into the seeds, you could use those in dishes, crush them up. And when they're freshly dried like this, they have this wonderful, almost fresh cilantro flavor. Now, I wanna show you one other option that you have as well. Instead of growing full plants of cilantro, you could grow cilantro microgreens. Now, this is a little bit different because what we have is about an inch of that high quality potting soil in a tray, and we have sown cilantro seeds over this fairly densely, cover it up, and let it sort of sit in the dark, you could do this indoors, until they begin to germinate and sprout. 
uncover them, put them in a shady area and let them continue to grow. This will take a couple of weeks for it to look like this. Then cut them off and sprinkle those over a dish and you're going to have the most amazing cilantro experience ever. One of the easiest things and most delicious things for any visitor to Oaxaca to enjoy in this market are the breads. Now this is the bread of Oaxaca. It's called pan de yema or egg yolk bread. And it's kind of rich and got a little anise flavor to it. But anybody that knows anything about Mexican breakfast breads probably knows about conchas. They're so delicious looking because they're not commercial. They're all handcrafted. One of our family favorites is the hojaldra. Now these are made sort of like a pita bread, so they're hollow on the inside. They're sprinkled with sugar before they go into the oven, and they're so toothsome, so incredibly delicious. A stall like this, well, you might just find it overwhelming when you come upon it because there's such incredible variety. And the first thing that you'll see is, uh, well, a couple things that you might recognize, like ancho chili and the guajillo chili. I always go for the chile pasilla oaxaqueño, or sometimes called the chile mije. What I like about it is that it's got this beautiful smokiness, medium heat, but a real sweetness that is unique in the chili world. Lots of different kinds of beans here. But one thing to think about when you're in a stall like this and you see variety that you just can't identify is if you can just engage the vendor in a little conversation of what they might do with it, well, you can learn all kinds of recipes and little tricks and um, details that'll make your cooking so much more interesting. Señora, me gustaría ver los chiles que me, me mostraste antes y medio kilo de los chiles negros. Exactamente, muchas gracias. No matter where you are in the world, cheese makes a great snack for a traveler and Oaxaca is no exception. There's two different kinds of cheese that you can choose from here. The classic is the quesillo. It's a type of string cheese, but it's got loads and loads of flavor. And then a type of fresh cheese or queso fresco. Then you can see that it's wrapped in a mold of woven palm. Now that's delicious stuff, but my favorite for snacking is the one that they call queso botanero, a fresh cheese that is mixed with epazote and some chili for spiciness, super delicious stuff. Now, around the corner here in this stall, you'll find something else that a whole lot of people love to take home, and that is the mole paste. Mole being the main dish of Oaxaca. You can pack it into your suitcase, and then when you get home, you simply dilute it with a little chicken stock, simmer it for a while, and you'll have the memory of Oaxaca come alive right in front of you. Now the meat section of the Oaxaca market can be a little bewildering to some people. So let's start with something that most people know and that would be chorizo sausage. This place is famous for it. But there's another kind of preserved meat you find here as well and it's the very thinly cut beef called tasajo as well as very thinly cut pork. It's cut like an accordion style and it is smeared with a red chili adobo that preserves it as well. Of course, you can find all kinds of poultry at the market. Stall after stall of raw whole chickens, that's hard to miss. And all over Oaxaca, they love to prepare roadside grilled or rotisserie chickens that are turned over a fire roasted spit. One of the most delicious meals I ever make is a simple roast chicken. Today, I'm gonna to take it step by step through how to do it on a rotisserie at the grill. But when I'm cooking a chicken, roasting it in the oven or on the grill, the first step that I always take because I like the texture and flavor is to brine the chicken. Now I'm gonna show you how to make a very standard brine. It's very easy to remember the proportions on this because I'm gonna start here with a quart of water that I'm gonna put into a saucepan. And I'm gonna add a cup full 
a fine ground sea salt to it. Now, a standard brine proportion is a quarter of a cup of salt per quart of water. And I'm gonna make a full gallon of this brine, so I need a full cup of salt to do that. But I'm gonna add some other flavorings just to add interest to this brine. One of the things that I'm gonna put in is a little bit of cone sugar from Mexico. This is piloncillo in Mexico. It's an unrefined sugar with a strong flavor. You could put a third of a cup of dark brown sugar in its place if you wanted, or just simply use a third of a cup of granulated sugar. Now I'm gonna add a little bit of pure ground ancho powder, a couple of tablespoons of that. That's gonna add seasonings that I really love, and a little bit of garlic. Garlic's gonna go in in a very simple way. I'm just gonna cut across the equator of this head of garlic here, drop it in, and I'm gonna put it onto the fire, turning it on to high and let it come to a full boil to dissolve all the salt and the sugar, and then let it cool completely. Now the remainder of our liquid for this brine is two and a half quarts of water and a bottle of dark beer. Our cooled flavorings here, the salt, the sugar, the garlic, and the chili, are gonna go into the brine container here and I'm using a 12 quart stock pot because I can fit two chickens right in here. Now I'm going to slide these two chickens. These are roasting chickens. You want ones that are three and a half to four pounds. I'm going to slide the two of them into this pot. I want to make sure that they stay submerged so I'm going to kind of push them down into the brine like that and then I'm going to put them into the refrigerator four to five hours in the refrigerator for the brine to affect the meat to give it that wonderful succulence and to season it just right. When you remove the chickens from the brine, dry them off really well. Then truss the chickens, tying the legs together with a good length of twine. Tuck the wings under so they won't burn and skewer the chickens butt to butt through the cavity. The spit forks slide onto either end and then you're ready to grill. Now my grill is equipped with an infrared burner across the back, so I could just spit cook these chickens entirely with the use of that, but I love the flavor of live fire cooking. So instead I have built a little fire, a charcoal fire here in the front third of the grill. I'll show you what that looks like. And I'm gonna augment it with a few of these pieces of branches that I've collected in the yard here. And that's gonna give a really nice smoky flavor to the chickens. Put the spit on, I'm gonna turn it on, and I'm gonna let those chickens cook for about 45 minutes. After 30 minutes or so, I'll start checking their temperature with an instant read thermometer. To add even more flavor to the chickens, I like to make a garlic butter baste while they grill. I melt a good sized chunk of butter in a pot and add to it some sliced garlic. After it's all melted, I brush the chicken with the garlic butter every few minutes until the skin is crispy, caramelized, and the temperature of the chicken reached someplace around 155 degrees. Then these steaming beauties are ready to be carved up and served. Since this chicken was brined, there's no need for a little sprinkling of salt over the top of it. Um, but I do like to decorate the platter with a little something fresh. And I have some sage from my garden. I've just put out some simple roasted tomato salsa to go along with it because well, the chicken's just so great, you don't really need a whole lot of accompaniments for it. Now, buying raw ingredients isn't really in the cards for you. Well, you can still take advantage of local flavor by sitting down at one of the market fondas, the little market stall eateries that you'll find adjacent to the produce market. I'm at one that's called Abuelita. It's been here since 1893, and it's always 
jam-packed with people. In fact, it's a great place to eat local preparations like moles, or maybe you want to have one of those great big playudas, the crispy tortillas, topped off with all kinds of deliciousness. Sometimes I'll order what's in front of me right now, which is in three coladas. Think of it as a sort of black bean sauced enchilada. This one's served with some chorizo on the side. They've got that beautiful fresh cheese crumbled over the top of it. Onions, some parsley. This to me is pure Oaxacan flavor. Now when you want to make in frijoladas at home, you know those black bean baked enchiladas, the first thing you got to do is cook beans. These are black beans that have simmered for about two hours until they're completely tender. And if you want to give them that real Oaxacan flavor, then search out some dried avocado leaves. I found these at the Mexican grocery store near my house. You just toast them a little bit in a dry skillet and then put them into the pot like you might a bay leaf simmering along with the beans. Now I'm going to strain out all the liquid because it's mostly the liquid that we're interested in when we're making in frijoladas. Set that over there. I'm going to take about three quarters of a cup of these beans and put them into the blender. And then I'm going to add some of the bean broth so that we can blend those beans until they're completely smooth. Top will go on. Turn it on. Now here's the thing, you want to plan in frijoladas for a time that you're going to use those black beans, the whole black beans, mashed into the refritos or in another kind of dish, and you're really going to focus on the bean broth, thickened with just a little bit of the pureed beans as the sauce for in frijoladas. So I'm putting all the broth in there. I'm gonna turn on the heat to about medium and I'm gonna let that reduce until it's about half its original volume. While the bean broth is reducing, I'm gonna make a simple chipotle salsa and it's gonna start with fresh tomatillos. The first thing, of course, that we have to do with the tomatillos is to peel off their papery husk. And then we're gonna rinse them off and slide them under the broiler. I'm gonna let those blacken and blister and soften for about five minutes per side, then take them out of the oven and let them cool completely. I'm gonna scrape the little tomatillos into the blender, and then in goes chipotle. Now I'm using the canned chipotle here, and then blend it until it's kind of a coarse puree. I'm going to season it with some salt and I'm going to thin it with just a little bit of water. Stirring it in till I get that kind of easily spoonable consistency. Final thing for the salsa is chopped white onion. Tortillas, of course, are essential for making in frijoladas, but chorizo is a flavor on in frijoladas that I absolutely love. That and little fresh cheese and some parsley, just the way that they do it in Oaxaca. Take the chorizo out of its casing and place it in a skillet set over medium heat. Stir it every once in a while for about 10 minutes, breaking it up until it starts to brown. Now let's talk about the corn tortillas. Typically, they are quick fried to soften them, then dipped into the black bean sauce. But I'm gonna take a slightly different approach here. I'm going to spray them with a little bit of oil. I find this not only an easy thing to do, but it, it involves less oil in the long run. So a little bit of oil on each side of the tortillas. And then I'm going to slide those tortillas into a plastic bag. Just fold over the bag, no need to tie it at all. Put them in the microwave for 60 seconds at full power and that'll soften them. I'm going to take one of these hot tortillas, grab it with a pair of tongs here 
and then dip it into our reduced black bean broth. Now, I have seasoned this with some salt already. I'm gonna fold it into quarters in there. Put that onto a plate. Spoon on some of the browned chorizo, some salsa, a little crumbled Mexican queso fresco, a few slices of white onion, and leaves of parsley. No visit to the Oaxaca market is complete for me without a stop at the 200-year-old venerable Chaguita Nieves stall. Now, Nieves are somewhere in between a sorbet and a really icy granita. I'm the guy that always falls for the tropical fruit flavors, but if you're adventurous, you might want to go for burnt milk, or maybe mezcal, or rose petal, maybe fresh corn, or mango with chili added to it. What I'm eating here is mango con tuna. Now, tuna is not, when you see it up on that list, what we think of as tuna. It means the prickly pear cactus fruit, this beautiful red stuff right here in front of me. We've been going to Oaxaca for Christmas every year since I can remember. It's a family tradition. And one of my favorite things to do when we're there is to go to Chaguita. I just love their coconut ice. And you know what? It's actually pretty easy to make at home, too. You don't have to worry about it being all smooth like a sorbet. It's great because it's crystally and icy. So to start out making that coconut ice, we're just gonna bring to a boil a little bit of coconut water, sugar, and salt in a saucepan. sugar is all dissolved. I'm gonna go ahead and turn off the heat and add my coconut milk. We're just gonna whisk this all together until it's combined. That looks good. We're just gonna pour this here into my brownie pan. Now this is ready to go into the freezer. Just make sure you stir it about every 10 minutes until it's frozen to keep it combined. You may be familiar with Jamaica. It's that dried hibiscus flower that they use all the time in Mexico to make that great drink out of the Jamaica. Well, if you make a syrup out of that Jamaica, it goes great with that coconut ice. To start out, you're just gonna boil a little bit of water and sugar in a saucepan. Now that this has come to a boil and the sugar's all dissolved, we're gonna turn off the heat and add in those dried Jamaica flowers. We're gonna stir all these in and let them seep for just about a half an hour. Now that I've strained and cooled the syrup, I've asked for a little assistance to save the ice. <laughs> well, it does take a little time and a little effort to do this. I'm using a large spoon to do the shaving, but you might feel more comfortable using a, a fork to do it. Mm, looks good. Beautiful. Mm. Got a little blood orange segments here. Mm. I love the Jamaica. Nice job. Thank you. <laughs> this really takes me back. Mm -hmm.